This episode of Coffee with Kenobi is dedicated to the memory of Marcus Doring. Marcus Doring just passed away. He was a wonderful member of the Star Wars community, a husband, a father, a member of the 501st, the first person to see at any Star Wars event that would come up, chat with you, give you a hug, ask you about how you and your family were doing. He is a man I will greatly miss. Marcus, may the stars light your way, my friend, praying for the repose of your soul. And now a moment of silence for Marcus. Thanks, everybody. Now on to the show. This is Tom Kane, the voice of Yoda in Star Wars The Clone Wars. And you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. Jedi. Ahsoka is Jedi. <laughs> Because of you, I did survive. And not only that, I was able to lead others to survive as well. Anger and frustration are quick to give power. But they also unbalance you. Work fast, I'm going out there. Out there? Out where? Just keep working. Everything you've heard about me is true. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. This is your weekly spoiler-free place for Star Wars community and conversation. I'm your host, Dan Zare, delighted to be talking Star Wars with each and every one of you. Since May of 2013, whether you're a fan of Star Wars films, Disney Plus live action and animation, books, comics, collectibles, or Star Wars opportunities at the Disney theme parks on Coffee with Kenobi, you are among friends as we virtually share a cup of coffee while talking about this galaxy far, far away. Thank you to the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Check out coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel for a no-cost, no-obligation quote and let them know that Coffee with Kenobi and Dan Zare sent you. CWK is also brought to you by Thomas Coffee. A fresh artisan coffee expertly roasted since 1905. Thomas Coffee provides customers of all taste palettes with a delicious coffee profile customizable with over 25 flavor offerings. There's a taste for everybody and an experience with every cup. I have a special discount code exclusively to Coffee with Kenobi listeners. Use the code DANZCWK10 for 10% off your order. On today's show, Ross Halvin and Jen Subchokchai join me to talk about part four of Disney Plus's Ahsoka. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. Here we are, friends. It is time to break down the brand new episode of Ahsoka, which we say every week. And thank goodness we've got new Ahsoka every week because we get to talk all about this incredible series. And I am joined by two incredible guest co-hosts. You know them. You love them. Let's bring them in first. Jen Subchakchai from The Long Take. Hi, Dan. Great to be back again. And for what a wow of an episode. I think that's the most common thing I've heard so far is just wow. Wow. That was what I put in the cafe. I just put wow. All caps, of course. It's all. It's definitely cap worthy. He's also cap worthy. I think he's a caps fan. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Ross Halliburton from the Fanta Tracks. Hello, friends, and let's just dive in because this was amazing. Okay, so I guess we're excited to talk about it, and I am with you. Let's start with you, Jen. Give me one word to the as far as describing the episode and overall reactions. My one word is haunting. Uh, mm-hmm. I landed on that because, you know, not necessarily because the tone of this episode was spookier than previous ones necessarily, but to me, the core of this episode and sort of the the narrative climax it seems like we've reached or about to reach is Ahsoka confronting her past, right? She has a line in this episode where she explicitly tells Balin, I'm not here to talk about my past. Well, guess what? The rest of this episode does not agree. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, for me, it was all about kind of like the past coming, coming back to haunt Ahsoka and she really has to kind of hopefully, uh, deal with it and kind of reconcile with it in some way next. 
I agree. And obviously, I didn't say at the beginning, but it, it stands to reason that if you're listening to the show, you realize that we're going to be spoiling it. We're going to be talking about, we are reviewing the episode, which is called Fallen Jedi. I don't believe I mentioned that, but this is, of course, titled Fallen Jedi. Ross, uh, very. it's just so that everyone knows when we're doing these recordings, you can put your name on the screen naturally. And Jen says, Qui-Gon Jen, as you would expect. Mine says Dan's there. I don't know how I came up with that. And then Ross is that Ross, tell us what yours says. Balin's beard, because is it-, it is sharp. He obviously doesn't use just for men. And I go along right with it with the with the gray in my beard. So a uh, big fan. You both have a lot of clout for sure. So is is that your word for the episode? Are you gonna hyphenate Balin's beard, or what's your one word for the episode? No, that was that was my approach to cheating, and it worked wonderfully. Mm-hmm. So My word for the episode is conflict Hmm. because I just feel like that resonated through so many characters and so many themes and scenes throughout this episode. So it was as exciting as it was. There was that tension that, that a great conflict story tells. Outstanding. My word for the episode is spectacular. It's spectacular. This episode, I was talking with some friends today. I think this is the Star Wars I've been waiting for since Return of the Jedi. I mean, it's it's absolutely wonderful in so many ways, which we will certainly talk about. I did something with this episode I have never done with anything on Disney Plus for Star Wars or anything at all. As soon as the episode was over, Mason and I looked at each other and I said, you want to watch it again? And he goes, yep. And we watched it again. Back oh. to back. Boom. Right away not even thinking about it because it's amazing. It's spectacular. What more can you say? Well, you can say a lot more, hopefully because you're listening to this podcast and we want to talk about it. So Jen, uh, earlier when we were doing a little bit of pregame session, you had mentioned that as great as this whole thing is, most of the meat is centered more towards the, the second half of the episode. And I agree with you. Um, so let's just at least address uh, sort of the the opening sequence all the way up to, I guess, the lightsaber duel in the forest, maybe. And then I think from there we can take the second half. But what do you want to say about the first half of the episode? Again, we're not shortchanging it, but most of the meat is on the second half. I think there was a good, you know, to, to go along with what Ross said, a really good ramping up of the tension and sort of it, it had the scenes themselves had sort of a calm before the storm, the classic sort of preparing for battle feel mm. to it. But the conversations that were happening were so incredibly tense and and had so much foreshadowing that every mo- second afterwards, I was very stressed out. So in particular, when Hu Yang says, "You know, I only want to ask you one thing: Can you try to stay together?" Oh. I've always thought that you've done better when you, when you're together, right. I'm not getting that. I did have that written down somewhere, but I can't find it now Um, verbatim, but he basically says something like that. And then that every moment after that, it's like, no, stay together. Oh no. Oh no. They're separating. Oh no. (laughs) So, uh, so I thought that was really, really well-crafted script for, for this episode because of that, because Mm -hmm. it really set everything up in that early scene that would then sort of pay off in 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 a big way later in the episode i want to ask you about this we hinted around to it last week at the end of the of part three but uh the majority of the first half of this episode takes place in a forest uh surrounded by leaves that can only be described as autumn i would say in tone talk to me about the symbolism of that I'm kind of putting you on the spot there, but I, I don't know. Sure. I was just trying to give Ross a chance to jump in. Cause that was, yes. <laughs> and I, I thought it was directed toward you. So I, I was okay. sitting back Never seeing where you're going to go. I mean, I've got a couple of ideas, like, but I want, I want curious to see what you both think. So, I mean, we have to remind ourselves and I've heard criticisms of the series. Like, I think I was reading a review this morning that was sort of like for a show called Ahsoka, it's not really about Ahsoka, which I don't agree with. Um, uh, I, I find that it'd be an anti-intellectual stance. <laughs> uh, but like, it has a very strong ensemble cast and all the characters are very important. So like, I, I could see why someone might mistake, mistake the focus of the show. 
But I feel like the autumn leaves, if they were to symbolize anything, would be to symbolize uh, Ahsoka's the point she's on in her her journey in her life as a as a force wielder and that you know a lot has happened in her lifetime as most of us who are you know the three of us and then most people who are listening to this probably know a lot of that if not all of that history and so this is sort of the autumn season where it's like leaves the things are falling off the trees she's you know in the what presumably is sort of like at least the start of the final chapter of her life right um and and so it's sort of like this time of reflection getting towards the end of the year um and really sort of trying to really feeling that for the first time because i think this episode what it does so well is sort of highlights how ahsoka has made lots of mistakes in her life Mm -hmm. ones we don't even know about which i definitely want to talk about later (laughs) Um, or ones that are hinted at that we don't we haven't really heard about before. Uh, she's made a lot of mistakes and she's she's been through a lot. And how is that really all gonna bear on the present moment and what she's choosing to do now? Yes, abs- I love that. I love that. I was thinking about, of course, with autumn with fall, you, it's hard not to think about death and rebirth, not in a phoenix uh, classical mythological trope way, but more like, you know, things get beautiful and then they die and then they eventually will fall down. We don't see leaves falling here. We see the stage being set, which is pretty perfect because Ahsoka does fall at the end of the episode. But there's no reason to believe that she's not going to come right back. I mean, come on. But I do like sort of the juxtaposition of that. Even Ahsoka skin almost is the color of the leaves, although that might be a <laughs> bit of a stretch. But I think you could probably do something with that. And the notion that everyone, like Sabine very much dies to self in a way. Well, it's actually, no, she's not really dying to self. She's not, she's being sort of selfish, but in a selfless way, mm-hmm. which I'm sure we will get to. I'm more interested in, the, first of all, Hugh Yang, Kung Fu fighting. Uh, if you, I didn't have that on my bingo card, but that was awesome. No. Rock them, sock them, robots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was really getting it. It was, it was great to see, and I think it's great. Actually, really kind of explains why he survived this long. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not just a passive. He's not the C three PO who's willing to be torn into parts and then carried away, right? Like he's he can right. he can take care of himself. There was that no also, oh my uttered from Hugh Yang, right? I'd be remiss <laughs> without mention. I love this episode, but the weakest point I felt was leading up to the droid fight, the level of nonchalance that we wouldn't normally get when someone's behind enemy lines with a broken down ship of just going, you know, it was just kind of like, ho hum, we're stuck here. No big deal. The bad guys are that are only a little bit far away. That was the only thing that was just like, ah, come on. It fed into more, but I feel just being fair to, our discussion. I wanted to bring that up I'm glad from there. Did. It completely ramped up and took off in such an amazing fashion, but it was kind of like Ahsoka, you, you know, something's coming up here. Sabine, you know, something's coming up here. How are we just leaving the, the ramp down and everything's fine? I, you know, I, I, I didn't catch that the first time, the second time I was aware of it, but I also thought these two have been in, in so many insane skirmishes and they are, they don't, I don't think that they necessarily knew there was going to be several um, force wielders there. Maybe obviously they knew there was going to be one, I should say, obviously, but most likely. So I totally see what you're saying. I, I'm interested in, and Mason and I talked about this a lot. Why does Ahsoka, who clearly uses two lightsabers, why does she switch to one for the entire second half of the episode? And I, I have a couple of theories. I think there's some symbolism there. As well, but I see both of you shaking your head. And Ross, we'll just start with you on that. What do you think? No, I was fascinated by that as well. And especially once she did go to the one and it turned more into that samurai Mm -hmm. pose. Like as when she killed Maroc and uh, let go his night sister magic spell or whatever it was that was existing inside that shell it brought me back to the clone wars when Kenobi defeated Maul. Yes. Where Maul was making this, you know, it was entertainment. It was almost like Indiana Jones where the guy has the big sword 
And then Indy just pulls out his gun and shoots him. It was one very smart move, paying attention to what the enemy's providing and taking advantage of that one thing. So all I thought, I was like, oh, that's Obi-Wan and Maul right there. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Thomas Coffee started in 1905 and has grown and established itself as a premier coffee. They have over 25 different flavors of coffee, including classics like almond, hazelnut, French vanilla, and so many more. And for the more adventurous coffee drinkers, flavor offerings include banana hazelnut, chocolate raspberry, maple bacon, and more. Thomas Coffee is known for five different single-origin coffees with a variety of different blends and roast profiles. The expertise in coffee craft is built on hard work and rooted in over a century of dutifully cultivating a network of coffee partners throughout the world. From conscientious growers in the finest coffee regions on earth, they roast their coffee in-house to make sure that they are sending out the best products possible to Thomas Coffee customers. Plus, Thomas Coffee ships nationwide too. You can order Thomas Coffee on their website, thomascoffee.com, and find them on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. For my Coffee with Kenobi listeners, you can use the discount code DANZCWK10 for 10% off your order. That's DANZCWK10 for 10% off your order. Get some Thomas Coffee and don't forget to use that code. It reminds me, I'm going to give a shout out to a friend of the show, and he was he was a former guest, Brian DeSutter. He's never seen Rebels, so he is watching this, the entire series concurrently with Ahsoka, and he, I think he's about halfway through the second season. And I said, have you gotten to the episode yet where Ahsoka fights two Inquisitors at once? He says, no, and I said, just wait. I said, because that entire moment was terrific because she's timing it, you know, as as you, uh, people, some people may know, the Inquisitor having the option of spinning their blade is because they are not as strong in the Force as most people they are defeating. So that gives them allegedly some sort of an advantage. Ahsoka times it beautifully. I almost seem to enjoy it, not in a, not in a sadistic way, but just sort of like, I got this kind of a game on sort of a way. But Jen, I want to get your take too. Uh, on the the one versus two lightsabers. I mean, <clears throat> I think it shows that as a fighter, she knows that sometimes less is more um, because it really, the, the, you know, to piggyback on Ross thought of, uh, was it Twin Sons is the name of the Maul Kenobi episode? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I thought of the Tales of the Jedi mm-hmm. where episode where she dispatches another um inquisitor uh, really really quickly and i had the same reaction to this where it's like oh it's so short but it's so tense dur- like you know for a duration and then and then comes to a dramatic conclusion and you know she didn't even have a lightsaber in that in that fight at all from what i remember <laughs> right um right and so so i think it's sort of like a yeah it's it's the it's the anti-grievous move right of like less you know <laughs> we can do we can do more with less um, and not and not and like when she does use it to it kind of shows us that she's not doing that to sort of be extra or kind of flashy right she's doing it for with the purpose in mind um the other thing too is like efficiently yeah. lethal yes exactly and to me when she's dueling balin towards the end it definitely has kind of like almost like a jedi training sparring feel to it because of just the position he's taking they kind of switch off like he's in the one position and she's in the other and they kind of reverse um so i thought just aesthetically that i think that was a beautiful choice it was gorgeous very well filmed and and again the sound mixing of this series the lightsabers really stood out even more than they normally do which is saying something i don't know enough i don't know i don't know i don't know anything about fighting with a katana or anything with taekwondo i will say i know this is going to give me all kinds of street cred but i was a white belt when i was eight years old i know that's very impressive i know but i don't i didn't retain any of that training um i don't know anything about sword fighting so i can't pretend to tell you from a from an actual practical point of view what two versus one means i know that to fight with two lightsabers is considered um, a very respectable, a very challenging thing to learn how to do. 
I know that Anakin and Yoda worked with Ahsoka to craft using that. And she uses two lightsabers to survive Order 66. You probably don't need to go on from that, but I will. She uses it throughout the Clone Wars uh, as she's building her career as Fulcrum, helping, you know, the the rebellion go into the New Republic. Two blades, always two blades. But then she switches to one. To me, one, twos become very defensive, right? Uh, whereas one, she's more aggressive, right? I mean, she destroys that Inquisitor, and, and that's, you know, par for the course in this series or just in Star Wars in general. But I notice it more with Bale, uh, Balin. It's, it's almost like there's like a lot of bravado here. And, you know, I'm not here to talk about my past. Balin knows how to pick those threads. And when she's, we watched it, and you probably noticed this too, she's the one who starts the fight. He waits, and he waits, and he waits. It reminded me of the Empire Strikes Back with Luke and Vader. But Ahsoka turns on hers right away, and she also attacks first. So Balin turns it on to defend himself. He clearly is a very capable uh, wielder of the Force and using a lightsaber. But I, I think that's really interesting. And and I froze the screen on this. He says, you and your master's path is one of death and destruction. He says probably, I guess we're just going to the end. I, he says like three different times during the fight. He, in, he very much, he doesn't sort of uh, walk around. He very much directly attacks her and says, no, you, you're the killer. You're the one who does the death and destruction thing. I don't know that with Ahsoka. It hasn't been shown yet, but there's something going on here. I mean, it's called Fallen Jedi, but I don't think it's Fallen Jedi because of the end. And I don't think it's called Fallen Jedi because of Balin. I think there's something more going on that we are just getting hints to. That's a lot, but I, I don't know. I think I think that is sort of the meat of this thing. You mentioned earlier, Jen, this notion that Ahsoka is fighting with her her what's going on internally. We're not really seeing that except for sort of loosely we've seen her deal with the idea of Anakin turning into Vader. But we haven't really seen a ton of internal struggle from Ahsoka um, to this degree. When she leaves the Jedi Order, yes. But this is a whole other thing. I think Balin really is the MVP of this episode, and it was so mm -hmm. wonderful to hear sort of his philosophy and sort of what's motivating him because I think that it's been largely shrouded in mystery until this point, right? We're, we know he's working for Morgan, but what is his agenda? He seems to not quite, you know, he's not rah, rah, thrawn, right? As we really find out in this episode. And I think it's clear that the Jedi order has scarred him, right? And that he's really like, and what's interesting. And so what's so interesting is that Maul and Ahsoka were such a great pairing because they were sort of two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm getting the same sense here where they both have had their issues with the Jedi order, but they're choosing to deal with it in very different ways. And so I think, I think his thing is like, he has the very classic villain. You can't create unless you destroy. So he clearly wants to remake the galaxy in the way that he thinks it should be, but it seems very much in response to the, the failings of the Jedi order. Um, and so I think he's looping Ahsoka in with that, even though he, even though she herself would probably say, no, I'm not a part of the Jedi order either. Right. When I think that goes back to some of, let, let's go back to those autumn leaves. Mm -hmm. Balin really drives that throughout this episode talking about, yeah, you know what? Some things need to die in order for something new to come about. So he flat out says that at one point and he's got two other great quotes that I liked here Two, two exchanges. Um, the first one, Morgan Elspeth, is that a note of fear in your voice? And just very stoically, he's like experience mm -hmm. and, and you get that feeling from him there. But then another point, she talks to him about faith and he, all he says is faith. I lost that a long time ago. So his depth and what we're going to learn about him as well. Like, Jen, I, th I think you nailed it in terms of this is the same path for characters from a different place. Yeah. And, and he clearly associates her with Anakin and Anakin with as emblematic of the problems of the Jedi Order, right? Because he says mm -hmm. every when she's like, you know, sort of 
making a snide remark. Oh, he never mentioned you, right? Sort of like trying to insult him. His response is everyone in the order knew Anakin Skywalker, right? So it's not because he knew him personally. It just Anakin was so famous as being this very talented Jedi and sort of, the, you know, the chosen one or whatever. If you would live to see what he became, surely that must leave a mark. Is that why you walked away and abandoned him? So mm -hmm. I, that was one of my favorite lines of the, of the whole thing and really cut to, you know, Dan, you mentioned that we haven't really seen a lot of the Ahsoka's internal struggle, but I think that line gets right to it right and it's like it does. really tell it reflects back what ahsoka must be carrying with her and it makes you wonder too like when right before ahsoka falls off that the dais um he says you know it didn't have to come to this but you know no other way and i it disarms her i think emotionally but as i'm reflecting on it with the two of you it, it makes me wonder is he talking about ahsoka did, like, did was there something that happened with the the three of them, or is are the sins of the master being placed on the Padawan or the the apprentice? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. I I know I've known for quite some time now that episode that part five of this, the halfway point of this series, was going to be a big deal. I didn't know why, but I knew it was going to be a really big deal, and I think we're starting to see why that is. It's interesting, you know, and again, when you watch that fight again, she's more she's more aggressive. I think Rosario Dawson is fabulous in this entire episode, in this entire sequence. And you can sense the frustration, even when she takes, um, oh, her name is, oh. Shin uh, Hati. Shin, and, and throws her against the rock, like Yoda does with some of the Emperor's Royal Guards in Revenge of the Sith. Like, she's not pulling punches. Right. She's not she's not fighting to disarm like there's some there's some aggression there. And we're definitely, definitely not used to that with Ahsoka. But boy, is it compelling. Yeah. And she said I think she says Sabine and yep. she's trying to defend. It, she thinks Sabine has died. Yes. Yeah. And I, I love the sort of hypocrisy that comes out in that moment. Right. Because mm -hmm. they the whole first section is Ahsoka trying to make sure that can I count on you? Can I, and she means, can I count on you to be able to let go of Ezra and not let your personal feelings interfere with doing what's right. And, you know, Sabine calls her out. She says, are you sure you think that? <laughs> and we see her struggle with that in this episode, right? Cause that's uh, arguably that is what causes her to lose the duel with Balin is that she gets distracted by her feelings for Sabine and worrying about her and being like, is she dead? Oh, she's alive. Oh, like, and like, cause she says Sabine with a very emotional look on her face twice during mm -hmm. like when she's hanging off the cliff. Yeah. Um, and so, so to me that showed her, her, you know, that was her moment of weakness and she couldn't do what she said that when the stakes are this high, I have to believe that you have to, you have to put your personal feelings aside. Um, and so it's really interesting how the sort of like hypocrisy that a lot of people would accuse the Jedi order uh, of having during the clone wars that that is now sort of like resurfacing through Ahsoka. She sort mm -hmm. of like, in, like internalized that, that hypocrisy without even realizing it probably. Right. And, and it's, and it's so easy to be the Monday morning quarterback and think about what should be done or can be done. But when your life is on the line, you think your friends are running. You're also worried about creating a brand new war and bringing back, we actually get to hear the line, the heir to the empire, which had to make fandom clap and cheer and rightfully so. But we haven't really talked much about Sabine. Ross rumor has it that you're a big Sabine fan. What yeah, do we learn was, about Sabine right. uh, in this episode? Do we learn anything about her, or is it just reinforcing some of her darker times? She's very rattled at the beginning, where she can't she can't find the ammunition for her blaster. She's got that going on. Ahsoka's kind of prodding her the whole time, like, "Hey, uh, you know, Jen, as you mentioned, Dan, as you've mentioned, it is." Are you okay? Can you do this? Are we okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fine. I'm good. Um, but we get to the point where they split up. And at that point, there the camera stays on a shot of Sabine's helmet mm -hmm. laying on yes. the ground. And I was just like, I remember watching that the first time through and being like, uh-oh, that's not a good shot to see right there. Um, right. and, and the and camera's like, panning sideways while yeah. while in the foreground is the helmet. Yeah, it's so great. 
So I was just like, oh, oh, this, this, this doesn't bode well for Lady Wren. And so what, what do you think is symbolic about that? I mean, I actually just did a bunch of stuff last semester about film and camera work. But I got to admit, even though I knew that was important, I couldn't quite tell you specifically what it's trying to say, other than she is moving away from her Mandalorian past or maybe something as simple as, She's about to be unarmed uh, emotionally, which obviously does happen. Yeah, I, I think losing her way mm-hmm. is kind this of this is the her, way, but it's not right. This yeah. one, the helmet came off, so this is definitely not the way. And I, I think that even that comes out a little bit more. And we know Filoni's a big Lord of the Rings fan as well. So as she's holding the map, that's all I could think of was a Silder in Mount Doom getting ready to throw the ring in and he just couldn't pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. And as Balin, he takes that deep breath and just like senses everything about her. So kind of how he disarmed Ahsoka talking about Anakin. He did the same thing to her talking about Ezra. And I was like, Oh, he is on his, his Jedi empathy skills are just top notch mm-hmm. and dug into that. And the next thing you know, he's got the ring of power slash the map in his hand. And the bad guys now, again, have the upper hand and it's back in play. But Sabine, knowing Sabine and what she's been through already through animation, her arc will be, I I imagine, a redemption arc. She's going to get to the point where she saves everyone after she messed up. And I think she's going to recognize that. Um, but we'll see how it plays out. I think it's setting up for that, but I also didn't expect her to cave there quite the way she did. Do you I, think she caved because Balin was using the force on her? Cause I feel like to me, it was sort of, it, it was, a, it seemed ambiguous. Like it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B maybe where he's like his force power is, is the psychological he can, he, cause it, it really seemed like he was almost sensing her history. Right, that he didn't know before, which I don't right. know if we've ever, I, you can both answer this probably better than I can. Have we seen that a Jedi do that, like as a force power to be able to sort of sense someone's past? So, um, I mean, Kylo Ren is able to use the force to sort of read thoughts, I think. Well, Vader Maybe. pulls out that Luke has a sister, there's that. Okay. Too. Uh, so, the, the, the that, devil has that, power to assume a pleasing shape, uh, as Hamlet would say. I don't think this is a force at all. I think this is, I mean, that it's very clearly stated. This is, he's the only one you think of as your family. Like he's your brother. And and I just want to say as a side rant, a really quick side rant, fast forward for 15 seconds. You don't hear this. Thank goodness. We're not going to have to deal with shipping these two. Okay. I'm back. Sure. (laughs) Um, The, the whole uh, idea here is that that's her family. And she'll do anything to get him back. And who wouldn't want that in a friend? Who wouldn't want that? Now, would you sacrifice Ezra to ensure there's not a war? Obviously, the answer is no when it comes to Sabine. And and you get that because there's one thing that seems more guaranteed than the other. You know, it hasn't been mentioned that Luke Skywalker is still around. I feel like he might have something to say about the strong guy showing up. Who knows what will ever come to that? But no, I think this is purely Sabina is at her weakest emotional point because she's vulnerable because of her love for her dear friend. And that, that whole family dynamic. I mean, Hera's rushing in to help. She comes in. Of course, it's a little bit too late. But I think this is purely that. And I think that Balin, he, I was trying to categorize him in Dungeons and Dragons. I would consider him like, he's obviously, I don't know. I would have to ask Thomas, but I think he's evil, but he's like a lawful evil. Like he's a bad guy. But he has scruples like he he saves, you know, when Shin tries to strangle Sabine, he saves Sabine's life. I gave her my word. You know, her previous master didn't didn't keep her word. I don't think that's necessarily accurate. But, you know, again, manipulation is a powerful tool in, in evil's box. And it makes it makes um, Balin really compelling. Well, and he gets to the point you talked about. Uh, Air of the Empire being mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Balin also says the greater good, which is the second Thrawn book in canon. So that's where I got excited because I I love the the canon Thrawn books. Mm -hmm. And 
when he said greater good, I was like, oh, that's not by accident, by accident. Like that is. Baloney would know. Yeah, that that is beautiful. And, you know, I had heard that he had talked to uh, uh, Zahn Zahn a little bit about everything. So it was just kind of like, okay, awesome. He's talked to the author. Maybe he's worked that in because of him. Um, But I got excited just by that little tidbit as well. Hmm. Well, you know, we're talking way faster than we normally do. Uh, and there's so much more to, to break down, but I think we've hit some really key ideas here. I just want to say, uh, before we get more into Sabina and Ahsoka and Balin, when I saw the ghost in live action, I was screaming. Like, my my son even said to me, Dad, I couldn't help it. I was so excited. And, of course, they show us the last day that the HasLab, the ghost thing is going on. Um, uh, so it was just great. The sound was there seeing her and Jason and Chopper sitting in in the ghost itself, having it fly, having the X-Wings show up um, was just awesome, awesome, awesome. And then we get to see the connective tissue from the Mandalorian and the book of Boba Fett. Uh, suddenly his name is escaping me. It is Carson. Carson, Carson Tebow. Tebow, of course. Yeah, Carson is there. All Soon Young Lee. Who That's is- right. He's such a fan and he cosplays and he's just he's so he's cool. a reason to love Star Wars that much more. Mm-hmm. Oh, I agree. I agree. So that that all of that was purely magical. This whole thing, as I said, was spectacular. It's such a it's again, I thought last week was doing this and it does. But this is such a wonderful example of of tension. Lightsaber duels having severe weight and heft and cost associated with them. Uh, stunning revelations that weren't cheap gimmicks. I'm happy that the Inquisitor wasn't like some mysterious uh, villain from the Clone Wars and like that. I, I sort of expected it. I'm glad we didn't get that. I'm glad we got this <laughs> eruption of gas, yeah. which normally would make people yeah. giggle. Um, that was it clearly associated with the Night Sisters in some way. I was so happy that we didn't have to go into cheap WWE reveals and shocking moments, but to stick to the core of the character. Everything done in this is in service to the characters and the story. It's never done to, to use some cheap special effects or to give you some insincere revelations that don't really amount to much for the overall mythos. All of it is in service to the story. And uh, John Favreau said at Celebration Europe this year, Ahsoka is Dave Filoni's magnum opus. And so far that has been absolutely accurate. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is, you know, and even that part with the ghost in the five X wings, you talk about the the audio special effects mm-hmm. and how the ships are moving. But like when they jump to light speed, and it is that boop 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 boop, like all on top of each other. Yeah, <laughs> Phantom. <laughs> it is I, like I rewound that. Like as I was doing my rewatch, taking notes for this. I played that like four times in a row because I was just like, oh, my God, that's so cool. I also want to remind everybody that because Carson Tiva shows up, we are only two degrees of separation away from Zeb. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I thought for sure we were going to see him. I thought for sure we were going to see him. And we I didn't. thought we weren't. We wouldn't see him at all. The, I know. And I know this is this is dangerously close to speculation, but I feel oh. like. I wasn't expecting to, I, I had said like, oh, he's not going to be in this show at all. Like that, that's why he was in Mando season three to kind of give, to satisfy that, check that box to make sure we were tied it over. But now that Carson Tiva is here, now my hopes are back up again, <laughs> where no, I'm like, maybe absolutely. now it's possible. Hey, if, if we can get the full has lab funded and get over 17,000 backers and get a figure of Zeb, maybe we can get him in the show too. That's right. What a day. What What a a day. day. Welcome to Zeb Day. (laughs) What um what did you two two think about Jason's line? I have a bad feeling. Did we Hmm. interpret that as because it almost it's very close to I have a bad feeling about this, right? Mm -hmm. Which is you know classic Star Wars line. But do you feel like did you interpret that as as him reacting to like being in tune with the force? That's in that moment. Exactly where I went with I was like Oh, he's having force tinglies and they're not fun right now. But what was even better about that line is that he starts it with mom. 
and then goes into it. And I'm just mm. like, wow, like we just, you don't get that much. And it, it is that moment of purity in this very rough moment. And maybe he's not understanding what he's feeling at the time, but I completely felt it was a disturbance in the force for him. And it's pretty important too, I think just to quickly, cause the show's not clearly not here is not the main focus, but to remind us, or to share with us that she's a mom that that adds more importance to her. But I, I thought it was both. I thought it was, I thought there, there was a nice possibility that he could be strong with a force and there's certainly pedigree there, but I also think he's just intuitive in general, right? He, he can just sense it. Like he's an empathetic person. His mom is extraordinarily empathetic and she's not force sensitive. So I love that how they did it. And I'm glad you brought it up Jim, because it's, it's sort of ambiguous. Like it's certainly plausible, and I think no one would bat an eye and say, "Well, oh, Jason's force sensitive." Well, of course he is. His dad's Ken and Jerris, but it's also possibly just he just gets, he just understands, and who knows what he's seen in his short life. I did like the line, you know, how come I always have to listen to the rules, but you can do whatever you want? She's like, "Well, when you're a general, you know, you can break the rules too, or whatever she says." Yeah, so put on your seatbelt. Yeah. That's right. You know, uh, and then Chopper. And I'm pretty that. sure Chopper says, "Yeah, what's up with that?" Like I, I went back and re rewatched <laughs> just Tim does. Lines, and it he sounds does. like he's saying, "Yeah, what's up with that?" <laughs> Which is such a great instigator, really. Oh man, uh, is there anything actually, else? Actually, yeah, go ahead. Just before we leave the Hera stuff, I, yeah. I, I actually it caught me by surprise. I teared up when Carson Tiva shows up, and then she says. Once a rebel, always a rebel. And so we had awesome. seen that in the trailer. So it really took me by surprise that I was really reacting to that. But it was such a great moment that she she finally feels more comfortable in her skin, right? Like we, we've we seen how she's had to kind of deal with the New Republic's bureaucracy, right? And it was really funny how the, is it Lieutenant, Lieutenant Officer Hawkins? I think mm -hmm. Hawkins is his name. Yeah. But he's he plays that with such comedy, Yes. Where he's like befuddled and is like, well, we, this is not following the regulations. What do we do? And she's just like, get over it. Like, it's fine. I'm going. <laughs> you'll, you'll figure something out. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day is is excellent. And as adept as she is, is working with people and being a leader. She is at her best when she's in the cockpit of the ghost. And then you guys, I'm glad you brought that line because once rebel, always a rebel. A classic Caroline, a nice hearkening back to Star Wars Rebels, but this is Hera, right? In the ghost. And it just doesn't get much better than that. So now, now we've got this um, StarWars.com reveal today that in, I believe, 10 cities and also uh, across the pond as well, they're going to be showing the fifth part of Ahsoka on a big screen. Ross and I texted back and forth about going to Chicago. Ultimately, I aired on the side of I wouldn't get home until super late and I couldn't do that to my son. I certainly couldn't do it without him, but it all got booked anyway. The tickets are free, but it, when you go onto the website and you can go to it through stars.com, you can get on a wait list because they've all been claimed. What a cool master stroke. And I, I'm really excited about that. And Ross, you did get two. I did. Oh, Excellent. nicely done. So I'm I, on the wait and list that's in only, LA. That's only a three and a half hour drive during the week for me. So no biggie. Hey, but you would do it for this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if it was just me, I would do it, but I, I just couldn't. As as much as Ahso Mason is into Ahsoka, I just couldn't do that to him. But I, man, it's so telling. I'll have to live vicariously through you. And of course, I'm assuming you'll you'll bring uh, Monica with you. So I'm calling her dibs on her swag. I just wanted to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, we'll see if she makes it. If she doesn't know if she's gonna go, so I don't know if that is Greg from Rebel Base Card joining or if I'm uh, he won't want to swag. Daniel Lowe or <laughs> you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there so that we there is not a confirmation on what's happening with the second ticket yet hey it's it's great it is it's a it's a terrific terrific thing is there anything else that you have uh, either of you have on your notes that you would like to bring up before we wrap things up well I haven't done academic corner yet I've been waiting <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for the right time. Yes. And we've sort of like come close, but not quite, quite at, a, at a moment where there's a connection. And we haven't 
talked about the very very end of the episode so hopefully this will get give us oh the there to is do it. that little Something there's happened. that, that little, thing, little little detail uh yeah. you know surprise a surprise guest and showing up at the world between worlds really nothing at all um mm. but i i what you know i said my word for the episode was haunting that was partially for me too as an ahsoka fan because the look on her face when she hears anakin's voice mm-hmm. is she looks so spooked uh and that led me to uh this the concept of the uncanny and that then led me of course to freud <laughs> because freud freud has an essay that he wrote called the uncanny that that's really about sort of like he calls it Heimlich and unheimlich, where it's like what oh, yeah. makes things really creepy psychologically. Um, and for me, that helped me kind of unlock about the a lot, unlock a lot of the subtext for this episode, especially in terms of where it ends and where it ends for Ahsoka. Because for me, it's like this idea of repetition that's really uncanny, right? She's been to the world between worlds before. And when she was there before, it was with Ezra and the current conflict, right? It really is, you know, he's not there yet, but he's, you know, he, we haven't seen him yet in person, but it's very much, especially her conflict with, Ravi- with uh, Sabine, very much revolving around Ezra. And so to me, there was just this like weird, like mirroring and, and cyclical thing. And so I went, I went back and kind of reread Freud's The Uncanny uh, and I came up, it was actually really hard to find one like a quote because Freud's writing style is very sort of inductive where he's just kind of circling. And so it was mm-hmm. hard to isolate something that was kind of neat and tidy <laughs> for me to read. Um, but what I came up with was, and now where am I, where is it? Uh, he says, there is the constant recurrence of similar situations, the same face, a character trait or a twist of fortune or a same crime, which depending on the translation you look at might also be misdeed, right? So mm-hmm. I think that kind of is inclusive of stuff happening in the show too. Or even a same name recurring throughout several consecutive generations. So like, if that's not Star Wars, I don't know what it is, right? That's uh, pretty great. Um, the theme of the double has been very thoroughly treated by Otto Rank, who's this other scholar. He has gone into the connections the double has with reflections and mirrors, with shadows, guardian spirits with the belief in the soul and the fear of death but he also lets in a flood of light on the astonishing evolution of the idea for the double was originally an insurance against destruction to the ego an energetic denial of the power of death and he he also it goes on to sort of talk about how like the concept of the immortal soul was originally psychologically as a like the first double as a, a sort of a survival mechanism um and so to me, obviously, there are a lot of kind of conceptual touchstones that remind me a mm-hmm. lot of of Star Wars in general, but also specifically this episode and the concepts mm-hmm. of the world between worlds. Um, but to me, this is sort of like we've reached Ahsoka's sort of existential moment. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and she's going to have to to sort of face this ghost question mark of Anakin <laughs> manifestation of Anakin through the force. It's unclear. He sort of has a line that indicates this is like Jedi afterlife. I don't know, which I was like, that was not my understanding of the world between worlds. So mm. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. Um, but yeah, to me, it really captured this feeling of like this whole series is like her returning to these various conflicts that she's had in her life. And if you go back to, and I'm almost done. Uh, if you go back to, uh, the siege of Mandalore and her experience of order 66. It's this really, this creepy thing where you, as an audience, we know what's happening, but she is so blinded by her love of Anakin that she can't process what Maul is trying to tell her. Right. And I feel like this is the, that moment. And she's carried that guilt with her of if only I hadn't had a personal attachment, I might've been able to prevent the empire rising to power. And I feel like that's what's motivating her right now is she Mm. knows that she made the mistake before and she can't make it again. That's so beautifully said. Oh, wow. Way to make it. Congrats on making it through the Freudian quote without a slip. (laughs) Yes. That would have been probably better because then you could have made a joke (laughs) joke about that. Well, you know, (laughs) so, you know, I'm, I'm the Anakin thing is is terrific 
And uh, I've heard some people uh, complaining about the, the 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 CG for Hayden Christensen. And you know, I I was certainly had some challenges with the new Indiana Jones film, but that was you know twenty plus minutes as opposed to like five seconds. Here's what I'll say about this. It didn't affect me at all. It didn't bother me at all. It did not take away from the pathos, the thrill, the excitement of the moment. I would ra- would you rather have someone else be Anakin Skywalker? Would you rather Anakin Skywalker not show up? Or would you rather be Hayden Christensen uh, a little bit de-aged to represent where Anakin Skywalker might be in this existential timeline in Star Wars? Because that's what I would rather have. Again, that's just me. But I, I don't know... And I also heard someone say fan service. I find that sort of offensive in, in a in a very non important way because it's not fan service. This is a story that spans generations in the real world with us and our children and our parents, and also in the Star Wars universe itself. Anakin Skywalker is linked to Ahsoka Tano, and that has happened since Star Wars: The Clone Wars first debuted. That. You have to have that if you're going to tell a full overarching story. I think it's fair to say that Ahsoka is more dependent on pre-existing knowledge of Star Wars than possibly anything that we've ever seen since Revenge of the Sith. And it works for me. It works for us because we're obviously very ensconced in this lore. But is there enough of a gateway there to draw people in? I think yes, because I think you'll be very fascinated to see who's this guy at the end. She obviously very excited to see him. And where are they? I think it all is just this wonderful cocktail of, of compelling mythological constructs. So a world between worlds, there's so little we know about it. We know the emperor wanted to knew about the existence of it. We knew he wanted to take it over and use it to take over the, the universe universes. And he could have quite easily, but it also sort of repelled him. Ahsoka and Ezra are responsible for that. But Ahsoka, in a way, sort of borrowed time because she was pulled out of time, fighting with Vader by Ezra. Then she's put back into it, and her life is saved. And, and then somehow she ends up, you know, in another place. And she gets reunited with our friends. So this is a really long explanation, but I promise I'm going somewhere with it. She, So I don't see Anakin as anything other than a Force ghost. And I think... When you're in a world between worlds, the rules are quite a bit different and strange. I think the world between worlds episode is one of the best things that ever happened in the mythology of Star Wars because it shows there's so much that can happen that we don't know about, which gives it much more of a fantasy vibe. I mean, it's always been science fantasy, not science fiction, because it doesn't try to really honestly argue for realism. But this takes it to a whole other place. And I feel, I mean, my assumption, and I'm trying not to speculate, but my assumption is this is going to be a great learning moment, a great apotheosis moment for Ahsoka Tano, where she gets a chance to make peace with the the inner demon that is Anakin Skywalker and all that that might entail. But it's it's just the most wonderful way. And of course, I was aware there was a Hayden Christensen rumor, but I was really good about muting that from my brain, using mental whiteout, whatever you want to say, because I didn't want to think about it. And then when it showed up, it was just as it should be in this story. Okay, I think I'm done. I think my my microphone just ran out of batteries. Yeah, but I, it's that it's a scene like that that bridges so many different stories, so many different characters, films, books, animation, live action, to bring all of that into just a. I mean, I don't know. What is that? A minute long? If that. If that, it barely, probably not even that. Like that's that's a beautiful moment of storytelling. And that, you know what? If people have a problem with it, I, I'm sorry you looked at it too intensely at some point. I I enjoy just sitting back and letting the story come to me. And I don't right. I I want to enjoy things. So I'm not trying to pick apart as I go. I brought up a point earlier in the show where I'm just like, okay, this jumped at me, but everything about this scene for me was just, this is the magic of star Wars. And this is why I love what George Lucas started and that Filoni is moving forward right now. 
And when we get to see Hayden Christensen, live action Anakin Skywalker, the Anakin that we fell in love with, with live action Ahsoka Tano. If you would have told me this during the Clone Wars Rebels, it would have been like the ultimate fan fantasy, right? And I don't know if any of you caught this, but the second time I use the captions, he calls her Snips. Snips. Yeah. I lost it. Yes. Lost it at that moment because I did catch it the first time I saw it. And all the feels, all the feels came <laughs> came well, rushing and that, in. That's, that's like the first thing he says to her. So it's a little bit further in the distance. Uh-huh. And I thought I it heard it on the first listen. Mysterious stranger or mysterious voice. It doesn't say Anakin. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. I, I knew Snips. immediately. It, yeah. It was. <laughs> and, okay, to go back to the question of viewers who have seen all the animated history mm-hmm. versus viewers who are coming to this with just maybe just live action or, or pretty fresh. To me, this scene to them, I, I would assume reads more just like sort of a classic fantasy trope of mm-hmm. and spoilers for Harry Potter and yes. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. If you so fast forward for like a like third 20, 20 seconds, if if uh, you don't want those spoiled for some reason. Um, but it feels to me like that kind of liminal space purgatory. You're being t- pulled towards death, but you could still come back. Yep. Right. Where you get some sort of key mentor moment, right. Especially with Harry and Dumbledore. I'm thinking mm-hmm. of where he, like they have that conversation and then he's ready to go back into the battle. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And same thing with rocket and Lila in guardians of the galaxy volume three. It's, you know, he, he's on the verge of death and she says, it's not your time yet. Right. Here we hear Anakin say, I wasn't expecting you so soon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, he was expecting her. Like, what? I want to know so much more about that. Um, but yeah, to me, to me, that's how it would read if you don't have the history. But if you do have the history, it's like the emotions are just magnified exponentially. The, this is the Joseph Campbell he- apotheosis is the hero's moment. In the apotheosis, the hero dies and is reborn. Often that is a physical death. But sometimes it is a spiritual death to an old way of thinking and a rebirth into a completely new point of view that changes you irrevocably forever. And I have the feeling this is what we're seeing. The Harry Potter thing is great. Mason actually brought that up too. Because it works. It works so, so beautifully. And the transition, the cinematic transition of the water slowly turning into this mystical energy and then the camera zooms back and I'm like, she's in a world between worlds. It's live yeah. action. Like, ah, I still so am not going to call this Rebels season uh, five because it's not. <laughs> but this is so great. This is so great. I mean, how do you how do you think this changes our understanding of the world between worlds? Like, what are we learning about the world between well, worlds? Well, I this? I think we'll be better able to answer that next week. Next week. OK, I don't I don't <laughs> think we have enough of a sample size. Because when there's fair. so little we know, I, I was I got to write about it for the the Star Wars book, and there's just not much to say besides what is in that episode, but it's pretty rich and it and it, 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 if anything it says, hey you know all those rules that we have established, there's more, we're not taking we're not eliminating what was there before, but there is more, and I think there's so much more that we're going to learn next week, isn't it great? Again to have Star Wars appointment television where you know that everybody. At eight o'clock central time, six o'clock Pacific time, you're hitting refresh on Disney plus and it's working and we're all experiencing it together across our own little worlds between worlds. We can comment about it online. And then we've got that excitement of, I can't wait till next Tuesday. And I feel that way. I, again, this, I think this is the star Wars series I've been waiting for my entire life. The live action stars I've been waiting for my entire life. I just think it's wonderful. And I'm glad because I, I liked the first episode fine, but this is this is so much more. It's so much more. Is there anything more that we need to say about this episode before we wrap up? We need our letter grades. Well, of course. Yes, definitely going to give our letter grades. Any, but any key plot points that I didn't mention or that we want to talk about? Can't believe I almost forgot about Anakin. <laughs> I was like, I we're thought, not ending this without talking about that. that. No, I'm glad you brought it up. It would have It would have dawned on me. Oh, I, we would have talked about it before we went off. I, I promise. Yes. Oh, I guess we, I did have one question and we don't really have to fully answer this, but okay. there's two hints to a betrayal by Ahsoka to Sabine mm-hmm. by Balin, right? He says, mm-hmm. 
it's the line Dan mentioned earlier of, you know, I will keep my I'll word. Keep my I'm like word. your former master. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what is that referring to? But then that combined with your family died on Mandalore because your master didn't trust you. Yeah. What does that mean? I don't, I don't, his head. <laughs> because she died because that did, that doesn't make sense from the timeline because her parents, her family died before she had anything to do with Ahsoka, really. I mean, they, they were, she was around. I, is that true? Because in Rebels, yeah, they were still Ross around. Ross can probably help us. Because she, she rescued, they rescued her father. But Ahsoka wasn't a part and of they, that. Right. Ahsoka wasn't there. So, they, so it can't. They then can't they went it. their own separate ways after that because Sabine mm -hmm. left Clan Ren again to come join the rejoin the rebels. Right. Which we don't see that that separation or any of that stuff. We but saw we like saw when her father died, which is I think this is the first episode of season four. But I feel like this probably has to sync up with Bo Katan in some way. Right? Or maybe because it has I feel like this is the Night of a Thousand Tears. Mm -hmm. and something like they were involved with that somehow we just don't know how how that's the only thing i could think of in terms of because we are working towards a mandoverse movie that's so, right syncing up that history for all these characters yeah. makes sense oh this is gonna be great i can't stand it uh, i i don't know what that means i that caught that line too I, I i was thinking about it i'm like what what is he talking about because ahsoka really has nothing to do with that aspect of sabine's life that we know of so mm -hmm. it's really going to have to be unique to be able to, to fit that into that puzzle. Unless it's somehow related to Anakin, but Anakin isn't related to Sabine at all. I mean, zero. So who knows? That we know of. Well, yeah, that and would be the line implies the line implies that they were master and Padawan at the time because your master didn't trust you. Right. Because it speaks, right. But speaks to their, their fraught relationship as, as teacher and student. Right. Which still... We need to see more evidence of that. There's there's so many more stories to be told, and I hope we get a chance to. Yeah, we're only halfway that. done. That's right, and there's just so much more. And like, I was thinking about the other day, boy, how you know the rebels had to be ostensibly a part of the rebellion against the Empire uh, post Luke Skywalker in the Death Star. But there's a lot of great stories there. There's a lot of great stories of Hera working with the New Republic and just Zeb becoming an X-wing pilot and. All this great stuff. So much fun. We're going off the rails a little bit here. So uh, we're probably going to wrap this up. But let's give our final thoughts and letter grade. Ross, we'll start with you. Yeah, I'm giving it an A. Um, it is. I'm going to I'm going to go probably like a 94 ish. Um, which I, I know you're going to go much <laughs> higher than that. I I still think this more is coming. an A plus. Well, and maybe wow, because it tough. broke my heart that <laughs> Sabine broke down. Maybe, maybe I'm very, I'm very sad. It. Listeners cannot see Dan's face right now. <laughs> He's losing his mind over there. I am. You may have heard something squishy fall out of my ear. But I, I, I don't know how many times I, I've given an A early in a season. Yeah. Um. So I, I consider this a super great do. grade for this. Mm. I, I'm, I'm ruining the rest of this podcast under protest. <laughs> 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 okay, that's great. No, that's cool. I, I was, Everyone, almost... it's been great joining the CWK for the first half of the season. <laughs> hey. I look forward to seeing who it is in the second half of the season. You Ross are Ross is in the world buddy. between worlds. He cannot be reached. <laughs> that's right. No, Ross, you're stuck, buddy. You're stuck. Okay, Jen, what about you? All right. So, at the risk of making you blow your top again. No. I want so badly to give this an A+. So badly. It was a revelation of an episode some of the best lightsaber duels I've seen since the original mm. trilogy. And I know that's a big take, but I, and I, you know, I may, I may backtrack on that the more I think about it, but I'm, that's how I'm feeling right now. It was, it was such a high, high of an episode, but I feel like it's going to be so much more meaningful if I save that plus for next week, because buckle up folks for some weird Dave Filoni force stuff. It's going to be so trippy and so amazing. And like, I feel like because we've the world between worlds is now on the table. I feel like it just opens up a whole, a whole, so many other possibilities. I'm so excited. And the, the, the rumors critically has been like from the, from people who have worked on the show that, that this next episode, episode five is the sort of crown jewel of the season. So, yep. Which is why it's going to be on the big screen. So I'm giving it probably C minus. It was fine. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> 
as Mason said, Mason and I, I said, what would you give this grade? I said, A plus. And he goes, uh, there aren't enough pluses. I agree. This is an A plus, 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 plus. I don't know. I don't know how this one is topped. I mean, if you want to talk about the emotional impact this had, taking again, Star Wars is always at its best to me when we take familiar archetypes and plus them and add new wrinkles and add new surprises. The lightsaber sequences you mentioned, we barely talked about them. Ahsoka uses the force uh, telekinesis to move someone into someone else as they are blasted and moves them back. There's so many cool things that happen. Her jumping off these That rocks. flip off the rock. Yeah. Yes. Just there's so much great stuff. Suspense, mystery, the appearance of Hayden Christensen in the in a world between worlds. I mean, besides me magically appearing riding a loath wolf, I don't know what else would be so more surprised. That would be really surprising. I would think I would remember something like that. Uh, this is just terrific. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> It's terrific storytelling. It augments what we already know and challenges us to think of things differently. And I just, I could not be happier. I, I have, I have a bag that has plenty of pluses and minuses. I have given Fs. I gave a couple episodes of Willow an F. I mean, I, I you know, I, I have no did. problem doing that. I, I'm not a generous grader, but just for me and my little happy little rubric, I base it on how I feel what it teaches me about Star Wars, what it helps me appreciate about Star Wars, and what it adds to the mythology, and this is it. Maybe actually that would be fun to do a whole episode where the three of us explain our rubrics. If you would have told my the first-year teacher, Dan, that I would actually want to talk about rubrics, he probably wouldn't have believed it. But here we are. (laughs) Here we are. Well, this is fabulous, as always. I I can't tell you how much it, it highlighted is for me to talk to the both of you about Ahsoka each and every week. You are... So much fun to process with and to learn from and to laugh with. And I can't, uh, I can't tell you again how much I appreciate you both. And the great news is I still got, you're still stuck with me. Not only Ross, but Jen, you're stuck with me too for another month. And I could not be happier about it. No, we love it too. It, it, it's good stuff. Yeah. It's we're so like good. who, who Yang says we're, we're at our best to, when we stay together. So that's right. And I, I, when this happened, I was like, have they never seen Scooby-Doo? Why are you splitting up? Are you kidding? <laughs> Yoinks. In, in the woods. Uh, yeah, right? The woods and the leaves and the, yeah. Okay. And there's like forced mosquitoes flying around out of Inquisitor's bodies, all kinds of crazy stuff. All right, Ross, uh, please let everybody know where they can find you and hear more of your melodic tones. Yeah, so I'll, I will ask people to check out Fanta Tracks for our recap articles. It is a group article that, that gets posted every weekend. So you're getting so many different thoughts from that. Um, I was able to join Brian Cameron on Good Morning Tatooine. You were great in that. You were awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it, it was great talking to him. You know, j- just a just another evening of talking with a friend in Scotland over the internet uh, mm-hmm. about Star Wars for a while. So that was uh, that was fantastic. Um, but then instead of promoting one of mine, check out the Rebel Base Card and what uh, Greg McLaughlin and Greg Cass are doing. With their with their breakfast shows around Ahsoka, mm. so they're super fun. So those guys, uh, Colby and the Colby cast and his kids, and just the, the great community we have all over the place. Aaron and David on Star Wars reactions, yeah. Podcast Stardust, yes. Yeah, so Dennis and Jay, a lot of great oh. Ahsoka content out there. Yeah. So enjoy it all. Everyone's great. Everyone's having fun, and it, it's so fun to listen. And get those little nuggets out of each of these who are just like, oh, we didn't even talk about that. Or, oh, I didn't think of it that way. There's so many great ways to enjoy this right now. And Jen, what about you? Sure. You can find my writing on thelongtake.substack.com. And I'm doing weekly breakdowns of Ahsoka while it's running. And really, this this with this series, I'm leaning much more towards sort of lore breakdown and analysis than I normally do. It's less, much less a traditional uh, review in terms of like how good was this episode and much more of a like what can what can we think about to better understand what we saw. Um, mm-hmm. So that's been really fun. And 
You can find me on Instagram and threads at Subchakchai, S-O-P-C-H-O-C-K. C-H-A-I, and on Letterbox at Qui-Gon Jen. Thank you so much to Ross and Jen for joining me once again to talk about the Disney Plus series, Ahsoka. Please go to coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. I am putting more and more into that site, and I hope you will check it out and let me know what you think. The official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi is MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. CoffeeWithKenobi.com slash MouseFanTravel is where you can go to get a no-cost, no-obligation quote. They can help you plan your magical vacation to all things Disney, including the East and West Coast homes of Galaxy's Edge, Walt Disney World, and Disneyland. Looking to book that Disney cruise? MouseFanTravel can help make things as easy as possible and give you that peace of mind we all appreciate when planning our family vacations. Just go to, again, CoffeeWithKenobi.com slash MouseFanTravel And let them know that Coffee with Kenobi and Dan Zare sent you. It is a great way to support me and the show and to get the best vacation possible. Speaking of supporting Coffee with Kenobi, go to thomascoffee.com. They are the official brew of Coffee with Kenobi. They have offered an exclusive code for Coffee with Kenobi listeners. Head over to thomascoffee.com to check them out and make sure to use that discount code of DANZCWK10 at checkout to save 10% off your order. CWK Live is Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time at coffeewithkenobi.com slash live, which will take you to Facebook and YouTube. Either way, you can like, comment, watch, and chat with me and Coffee with Kenobi members from all over the world. Go to the Coffee with Kenobi Facebook group, which is our CWK Cafe at coffeewithkenobi.com slash community for Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler, and drama-free place. It's also a great place to share your immediate thoughts on Ahsoka when you watch it if you can't wait until you can join us on CWK Live. This show is literally possible because of the CWK Alliance. That is our Patreon page, and thanks to our members of the CWK Alliance, this podcast, Facebook Live, event coverage, and so much more comes to life. Find out how you can join the show and help us out for as little as $1 a month by joining the CWK Alliance, and you receive access to CWK Prover an exclusive weekly audio and video podcast not heard anywhere else. Members at the CWK Alliance All-Star level receive a video edition of CWK Pour Over and access to a private Facebook group as well. Plus, CWK Alliance Grandmaster join me for a monthly live video call and that can all be found at coffeewithcombi.com slash CWK Alliance. And 10% of these monthly contributions that you give go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital. Got a question? You can email me, danz at coffeewithkenobi.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zer, M R Z E H R, on Instagram at danzair, C W K, and on LinkedIn. Coffee with Kenobi is on social media such as Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and TikTok. You can give the show a like at facebook.com slash coffee with Kenobi, or subscribe to Coffee with Kenobi's YouTube channel, where you can find over 700 videos, past live shows and events, and this podcast. Please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Every review makes a big difference in letting other people know about the show. Like the Coffee with Kenobi logo designed by co-creator Corey Club, go to our tea public store at coffeewithkenobi.com slash shop. And if you want to start a podcast or a blog or expand your brand, go to danzamedia.com. I'm available to help you with your brand help you brainstorm whatever you need. And I can also come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. Thank you, as always, for joining me for a virtual cup of coffee. I appreciate your time and look forward to the next opportunity to talk Star Wars with all of you. I'm Dan Zay reminding you that this is the podcast you're looking for. Good journey, friends. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Come along.